dear Professor Yilmaz, dear uh, Mr. Strack, distinguished guests from Turkish and European business community. On behalf of TUSIAD, I would like to welcome you in our webinar on China and global economic order, which we will discuss from <coughs> the perspectives of Europe, Germany, and Turkey. It is a great pleasure for us to co-host this significant event together with the distinguished organizations, German Federation of Industries, in cooperation with the program of economics at Sabancı University. TÜSİAD, being a voluntary, independent, non-governmental business organization, plays a significant role in the Turkish economy. Our members account for 85% of Turkey's trade volume, employ 50% of the private sector workforce, generate around 80% of Turkey's corporate tax revenue. We represent uh, the Turkish business world through our membership in Business Europe, the Global Business Coalition, Business and Industry Advisory Committee of the OECD, Business Med and BRICA, uh, Belt and Road Industrial and Commercial Alliance. China, as the second largest economy of the world, has been among the priority countries of TUSIAD for over 10 years. We coordinate our China-related activities to TUSIAD China and Shanghai networks, which I'm presiding. Our main aim is to contribute to intensify economic relations between Turkey and China and follow closely the developments in China which transforms at an unprecedented pace. We organize high-level conferences, webinars, to better understand China and its business environment. Uh, we arrange uh, sector-based meetings to explore opportunities in bilateral economic relations and share our position with the Turkish, Chinese, and European authorities. Today, China is one of the leading players in shaping the global economic order. After four, more than uh, four decades of economic reform and opening, it is experiencing a deep and rapid transformation process in all spheres of the economy and social life. The Chinese government is implementing a comprehensive and ambitious development agenda. According uh, to the outline of the 14th five-year uh, five plan and vision 2035, which is announced in the fifth uh, plan of the 19th Central Committee of the Chinese Communist Party in October, there is a strong focus on technology and innovation, which occupies the core position in China's modernization drive. China targets to become a global leader in innovation by making major breakthroughs in key core technologies. It will also implement dual circulation strategy, focusing on the growth of uh, domestic consumption and technological innovation to provide its self-sufficiency and limit the effects of the possible decoupling from the US and the pandemic. While uh, much of the world tries to prevent new waves of coronavirus from hindering the fragile recovery from recession, innovation and the pre-existing digitization, which were further reinforced by shock of pandemic, are fostering economic growth in China. According to data released by the National Bureau of Statistics, economy expanded 4.9% in the July to September quarter compared to a year ago. China's imports and exports have also grown quickly in September, with imports increasing by 13% and exports rising 
almost 9% from a year earlier. In view of the positive momentum through the last seven months, Chinese economy remains resilient with great potential and its GDP is expected to surpass 1 trillion, 100 trillion yuan, 14.9 uh, trillion dollars mark in 2020. While all the governments ex across the whole world fight the pandemic and its devastating effects on the economies, China looks like to be the only large economy in the world that will end the year with a positive economic growth. We believe uh, that global problems can only be solved with genuine cooperation efforts of all countries and any meaningful reform of the world trading system cannot succeed without US and China's and all countries meaningful presence. Dialogue, communication channels and multilateral platforms are key factors for the smooth functioning of the global economy. If the West and China could further cooperate bilaterally and multilaterally towards win-win scenarios, this would positively impact and bolster the global economy, peace and prosperity. Today, yeah. we have distinguished speakers from different countries and institutions. We will try to explore the role of China in the global economic order, touch upon the Europe's economic relations and disputes with China and analyze the economic consequences of the evolving global rival rivalry between the US and China for the European Union and the rest of the world. I believe this is a very timely event held just after the US elections. And I strongly believe it will be very beneficial for all the participants with an interactive Q&A session. I thank everyone uh, for participating again. Now I would like to give the world Professor Bahri Yilmaz uh, from Sabancı University to make his welcome remarks. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Kurdolu, for your introduction. Dear participants, ladies and gentlemen, first of all, I would like to welcome you to the joint webinar on China. The topic is today, Global Economic Order in China, Perspectives from EU, European Union, Germany and Turkey. This conference is organized in cooperation with the Federation of German Industries, BDE, Turkish Industry Business Association, TUSIAD, Program of Economics at Sabancı University. Web webinar conference wish to explore the following topics. Firstly, it will focus the role of China in the global economic order. The question is, will China dominate the rule of the world economy in the coming years? And secondly, we intend to focus on the EU's, European Union's, Union's economic relations with China and disputes between Berlin, Brussels, and Beijing. Then we will concentrate on economic relations of Turkey with China. Finally, the possible causes of the evolving global conflict between the United States and China and analyze the economic results and the consequences of this economic war for the European Union and its economic relations with China before and during COVID-19 pandemic. Ladies and gentlemen, um, before we start with our program today, I would like to give some key facts on Chinese economy. The first one is, it, it is undeniable fact that China is raising economic power of the 21st century and emerging global player. China is an economic, economic miracle, but not an economic mystery. Today, China was one of the three largest global economies, including the United States and the European Union, the world's larger exporter and the third larger importer. 
largest manufacturing sector in the world. Since 1978, the country has transformed from one of the poorest low-income countries to one of the leading world economies. The Chinese economy accounts one-third of the global growth. Over 80 million people have been carried over the poverty line, and many in China has reached upper middle class status. Per capita income was in 1976 just $276, and today approximately $1,000. The second largest recipients of foreign direct inflows, inflows in the world in 19, 2017 behind the United States of America. In July 2020, Chinese foreign exchange reserves accounted 3 trillion, 50, 15 billion American dollars, which is the highest foreign exchange reserves of any other nations. Okay, I would like to thank to all of you, ladies and gentlemen, for your participation. I wish to all of you a successful debate. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bari Yilmaz. Uh, and I jump in directly um, for the last welcome part. Um, uh, dear Korhan Kordulu, dear ba Professor Bari Yilmaz, um, dear colleagues from TUSIAD, um, Dear participants, ladies and gentlemen, um, it's a great pleasure for BDI um, to work together with TUSIAD on China issues, um, not only in this seminar, um, not too many people in the European Union know that TUSIAD is a full member uh, of our European Umbrella Association Business Europe, and we are closely cooperating with TUSIAD in Business Europe um, and we are proud to have TUSIAD in the group um, of European industry associations. Um, on China, um, uh, we uh, are happy that Professor Yilmaz and TUSIAD, together with you, we had an opportunity to discuss BDI's China paper last year in Istanbul um, in your China seminar, um, the BDI paper um, that we published in January uh, two years ago. Um, this PDI paper um, sort of sets the tone um, of the discussion we are in the China debate for the past two or three years. Um, it's the partnership issue with China. It's China as an economic partner, as one of the most important markets for our industries, um, one of the most important economic players in the world market. But on the other hand, China at the same time um, is considered by BDI, by this BDI paper, um, but by um, European politics um, and by a position paper we jointly issued um, in Business Europe as a systemic competitor. Um, and in this tension between China being the, one of the most attractive markets for our companies and systemic rivalry vis-a-vis -vis China, we have to sort out a lot of issues. Um, and to make one point clear from the beginning, um, the answer of BDI at no point of time was that a decoupling from China could be an answer to this systemic rivalry. We need dialogue, we need partnership, and we need joint solutions including China. Um, second point, um, of course, our relations from Europe and Turkey vis-a-vis -vis China, um, we have to define it into the global framework. And the overarching theme in the global framework is the conflict that has already been mentioned by you, Koran. Um, it's the global conflict between the United States and China. Um, and indeed, the answers that China and the US gave if on their systemic rivalry definitely include elements of a decoupling on the Chinese side, on the US side. Um, and whether this makes the room for
for our industries in cooperating shrinking in the future, we will see, and this is one of the main questions we will have to the panelists. Um, a second, uh, last and third remark um, that I would make in the beginning is, my personal feeling is that um, at the moment we have a lack of real dialogue with China. We have dialogue fora, for example, the EU-China dialogue um, that took place twice on a high level format this year. Um, one uh, was in early June um, when we had uh, uh, the, especially von der Leyen and Michel in a long debate with the Chinese leaders um, over ongoing issues. Um, and the second uh, sort of a, a replacement for the, for the planned special summit um, that should have been held on China with the Chinese leadership um, in Leipzig um, in September this year, and that could not take place due to COVID. We do have these dialogues, but the dialogue we see, if we analyze it, it consists mo mostly of the Chinese presenting their position, the Europeans presenting their position. We have the same in the so-called dialogue between US and China. Um, and there's no real movement towards each other. There is no real understanding for the positioning of each other. Um, and this lack of, of real dialogue is something um, that drives many old China hands um, when they compare it to a couple of years ago. These three issues um, of partnership versus systemic rivalry, um, the global landscape where um, the conflict between China and US always has to be taken into account. And this element of where can we improve the dialogue with China are probably um, three of the topics that we jump into if we enter um, the first panel session now. The first panel session is on geopolitical relations with China. Is China a systemic competitor? The panelists we have invited and we are very happy that they accepted our invitation um, to discuss with us these issues and dear participants of today's webinar, um, you might join the discussion um, in the, in the uh, chat by using the question and answer session, the chat uh, function. Um, uh, and uh, I will try to pick up your questions um, in the later part of the debate. The panelists is first Maike Okano Heymans. Um, she's Senior Research Fellow at Klingendal Institute for International Relations based in Den Haag. Um, you joined the Institute um, in 2006 and you specialized um, on, uh, on Asia Pacific issues, um, but in the younger history also a lot on, gl on global issues. Mehmet Oeitsch, um, you are the chairman of the Bosporus Energy Club, the chairman of the London Energy Club, the CEO of Global Resources Partnership. Um, you have a couple of board functions, uh, board membership functions and advisory board functions um, uh, that would take long if I would mention all of them, um, based on in the energy industry, in financial services and in investment. Um, in previous, in your previous professional career, you had executive positions uh, in the International Energy Agency in Paris and also in the OECD in Paris. Our third panelist, and a special welcome to you, Dr. Jasper Wieck. Um, Jasper Wieck, um, in summer 2020, summer this year, um, was, um, was, uh, promoted Deputy Director General for East Asia, Southeast Asia and Pacific in the Foreign Office um, in the German Federal Government. Um, he, I would like to mention, and I'm quite sure that he will 
uh, hint to this paper later on. Um, he was one of the main drivers and responsibles um, for the new Indo-Pacific strategy that the German government launched in September 2020. So we are extremely happy to have you here um, in the debate. Um, you joined the Foreign Office in 1994 um, and postings that you had in the German Foreign Office included Azerbaijan, Russia, Brussels um, and your last posting before you went back into the, the, uh, the uh, central office in Berlin uh, was, of course, in New Delhi, India. A pleasure to have you with us. Um, we start this session with introductions, um, and I kindly ask the panelists um, if you would be so kind to limit your first interventions possibly to five minutes that will help us and give us most room for the discussion. Um, Maike, I would like um, to have you start and kick off um, and give you the same order as I presented the speakers now. Um, so we start with Maike, um, her introduction. Mehmet, uh, we continue with you. Um, and Jasper, um, I would kindly ask you um, to be the third one um, with the introductory remarks. Um, and then we immediately enter into the discussion on uh, the, the issues that you laid down uh, for the further course of the discussion. So, Maike, please, the, the, um, the digital floor is yours. You have to unmute yourself and then... Yes, of course. Thank you so much, Friedling, for this uh, opportunity. Uh, it's great to see you again. And uh, I'm very happy to be uh, part of the conversation here with uh, Turkish partners. And uh, I don't have the opportunity so often. So I'm very uh, interested also in learning from, from their views. Um, my very short answer to that question of the panel um, of is China a systemic rival? Let me start with that. Uh, just to make it very clear, I think it's uh, a big yes. Uh, for the reasons um, that uh, were also already introduced just now. Um, and I would like to add from my side that I think the challenge is actually twofold and we have to distinguish between the two um, because this relates both to the organ of state and markets, so the political philosophy and the economic systems, um, how do we design them. In that sense, I think China is a systemic rival. It organizes its uh, society uh, and economy very different uh, from Western societies. Um, and also as an extension of that, as China is conquering the world, its companies are going everywhere, um, we also see increasingly more a normative challenge. Um, and I will uh, um, well, add a little bit more detail, of course, of where I see the normative challenge. Um, I should also like to add that it's this is not a new thing. Um, I think it's now on our agenda because uh, China is becoming a greater economic competitor and it's no longer just the attraction of the market, but it's also China in Europe um, that is very much present. Um, and therefore we are having this conversation now. But in my own work, um, already 10 years ago, I wrote about how China is changing the rules of the game um, in international relations, um, in international governance. Um, eight years ago, I had this uh, op-ed in uh, um, on we have to screen foreign investment, and that was also related to the China challenge. So just to emphasize, to me, this is not new. What is new, of course, is that we're having this debate. Um, and I'm very happy that it's uh, we are um, in Europe now, in the EU, and in all the EU member states. Of course, um, the EU in 2019, just uh, two months after your excellent BDI paper published its own EU-China strategic outlook, uh, my own government uh, in the Netherlands in May 2019 published the China policy paper. Um, so finally, we are having this conversation. Um, and if anything, I find myself now oddly enough on the other side of the conversation, uh, hoping that we won't um, go into the black zone, um, whereas we first were in the white, you know, all about China was an opportunity. Um, I'm afraid, I'm a bit worried that we are now moving in all too black. And I think the real challenge that China is posing us to is to discuss the gray zones and to deal with the gray zones because everything I think um, about China is very gray. Um, and in the, in the figuratively speaking also, because um, the way that they exercise power is so much more subtle than what we are used to um, through a combination of political and economic and um, military instruments. 
Um, so it's a not, it's a hybrid warfare, as some people use it, call it, or foreign influencing, if you will. So we have to deal with this. Um, and I think the COVID um, pandemic added to this crisis. Um, of course, we have the US-China uh, trade tech conflict, uh, but the COVID crisis showed how important digital is. Um, so I believe I have a, a little bit more than a minute left. I'd like to call attention to this digital field um, because I see with the digital Silk Road that was launched in 2015, that marked a shift in the overseas focus um, of China's um, companies. So it went from transport infrastructure and from trade networks towards expediting the global expansion of Chinese companies in the high tech field. And this was of course building on China Made in China 2025 that was published already a, a few years earlier, where China basically, with a, a grand industrial strategy of the size that we had never seen before, uh, showed the government's intention to steer the economy in a certain direction. Um, now we are entering a second phase um, with uh, China Standards 2035 plan, which is basically a blueprint um, to craft uh, domestic international standards with the plan to eventually also internationalize them um, to other parts of the world. And this is, I think, a next step. So first building domestic strength with the 2025 plan, have the BRI, the Belt and Road Initiative to export that to the world. Then the digital focus with the digital Silk Road, which unfortunately is way too little discussed if, in my view. So I hope we have a little bit of time for that um, in, the, in the discussion. Um, and then now this China standards um, plan, which of course can only be materialized by way of the Chinese uh, digital companies. And we already see, of course, that those are making headways into especially Southeast Asia, where the presence of uh, WeChat, of Alibaba um, is, is extreme um, and uh, many other platforms as well. I think I should leave it to that for now because my five minutes are up and I look forward to, uh, to the discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Michael, for uh, precise and very sharp uh, comments uh, to kick off the discussion. Um, Mehmet, um, how would you answer from the Turkish perspective the question, is China a systemic competitor? Well, first, I'd like to thank you to see that us together again. This way we are tracking what's happening in relations with China. This is a very useful exercise. Thank you for that. I think I will challenge the assertion that China is the second largest economy in the world. It is not. It is the largest economy if you calculate it on the basis of purchasing power parity. Also, if you include Hong Kong, Taiwan, Macau, and also China dominating Malaysia, Indonesia, and other Southeast Asian nations, China is already the world's largest economy by any definition. So when you call it a systemic rival to Europe, US, or whoever you are calling it, it is natural because such a big power, one in every five in the world is Chinese. This is a country where real technological breakthrough is taking place in artificial intelligence, in space technology, in renewable energy, climate change, whatever you call it, agricultural revolution, China is the leading power of today. And by 2049, as we know, this peaceful rise strategy of China, it is going to become the world leader in every area almost, including military, if it continues its trajectory, current trajectory. There might be, of course, domestic troubles, uh, natural calamities, confrontations, whatever. I exclude all this. Therefore, when you call China a strategic or uh, rivalry in many areas, this is only natural because the new power is entering to the established order. Open space for China, be in the world governance, be in world trade, investment, technology, what you have, then you will have a not only rival, but you will also have a competitors or a hostile power confronting you in every area. So we have to make a choice, as you also implied in your opening remarks, whether we are going to be in cooperation, collaboration with China, or we will confront it, as Trump administration has tried to do for so long. 
And we also had a previous discussion, as you remember, whether Biden will continue the same trajectory with China. That means a new Cold War will be coming in a very forceful manner. Not the kind of Cold War that we have witnessed with Soviet Union and the United States, but this is a more sophisticated, more complex Cold War in which parties will be forced to take sides. So whether European Union now sort of converging its policies vis-a-vis -vis China, it's not only German, French, Spanish, Italian policy vis-a-vis -vis China, but EU policy is emerging now in Brussels. That's a huge gain because Chinese, as you know, love bilateralism. They want to deal with you individually. But if you are together, you will be more powerful in terms of reckoning China. Whether Europe will work with the United States is another matter. If it does, then we will have the traditional West versus China. Then China will be having its own alliance with Russia, currently in bed through a strategic uh, marriage of convenience. Then you will have Iran. You will have other powers, which China is trying to bring to its rank through BRI, Belt and Road Initiative, an initiative which I will call a visionary project. I don't think anywhere in the world you have a similar all-encompassing initiative as Xi Jinping has instituted, even included it in the Chinese constitution. West doesn't have a similar initiative so far. China spent almost a trillion dollars to make it work across 85 countries, and it will bring also geopolitical benefits to China, not only along the Silk Road, ancient Silk Road, including Central Asia, Caspian, Turkey, Europe, but also through the ancient maritime road, all the way to Africa, even to Peru, they are talking about. So it is going to be a huge challenge. If we think it is uh, only rivalry, that's natural. I don't think there is any danger in that. If we take the same attitude as the United States, sort of a new Cold War breathing, that's very dangerous for the world. I think Europeans can play a moderating role in this regard, protecting both sides of this. Coming to Turkey from the Turkish point of view, I don't think that Turkish-Chinese relationship has reached the level that especially Ankara wanted it to. Because the hope was that if the relations with the US and European Union are in shatters, not working well, and Ankara is excluded to a great extent, and then perhaps China and Russia could have been the best partners for Ankara. It has not worked that way for a number of reasons that we can discuss in the other sessions. But Ankara will be forced to make a decision either in favor of the West, meaning US and European Union, or working together with China and Iran. And I think this is a strategic choice, not only for Ankara, but for the European Union as well, because we have seen some positive engagements coming from Brussels in recognition of this strategic rationale. If you leave Turkey in such a situation, isolated, neglected, for good reasons or bad, I'm not discussing that, but if you think in a geopolitical mind, Turkey should belong to the European Union as a partner, as a future candidate country for accession, not today, we know, it's going to happen perhaps in 20 years, 10 years or never, but a positive engagement, which already started showing uh, signals, uh, will be critical in bringing Turkey to the European fold, rather than letting it go Chinese and Russian Iran Iranian way. So that's an important, I think, uh, element to consider. There are serious issues between Turkey and China. Trade deficit, almost $22, $23 billion deficit in favor of China. This is the same, of course, with European Union and US, $348 billion. And also there is this uh, lingering problem of Uyghurs in the Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region. No matter what happened between Ankara and Beijing, this crisis, confidence crisis, has never been resolved. It's going to be there. China has ambitions in Persian Gulf, also Middle East, where it is getting the bulk of its crude oil and LNG. And it also has military ambitions in that region. Then what will happen with Pakistan economic corridor? Turkey's assertive stance in the, mid, in the East Mediterranean, in the Red Sea and also Gulf. 
So putting all of them together, it looks that we are at a crossroad where European Union, United States, Turkey will have to make some faithful decisions to determine how the future will flow. But a country like Turkey, my personal opinion as a former diplomat, is well positioned to be a real bridge, working in harmony with Russians, Chinese, Indians, Iranians, as well as with the European Union and the US. That's the ideal situation. Whether it will happen or not, we'll see. So don't see China as a systemic risk or competitor. It is. It has to be, given its dimensions and fundamentals. We have to look ways of positive engagement, how we can work together. And I think we'll see the first signs of this from the Biden administration as well. Let me stop here. Thank you very much, Mehmet, for a very deep analysis uh, of the relations and some very good hints vis-à-vis -vis, um, policymakers. Uh, Jasper Wieck, um, uh, what would you pick up from, uh, from the hints that Mehmet lays on the table? Um, what, how is the debate at the moment in the German government uh, on China issues? Uh, thank you, Friedrich, and thank you to the co-hosts of this uh, webinar, very inspiring, my previous speakers, and indeed I would like to pick up on a couple of ideas. Being an historian by um, education, uh, I would like to give you a broader context about uh, the systemic challenge of the People's Republic of China, because in fact, it is not new. Ever since uh, the People's Republic of China was created, it was a systemic challenge. And in times of uh, Mao Zedong, uh, the gap was so huge that we even couldn't bridge it and we had uh, no diplomatic relations. And let me also remind you that we had a huge systemic difference also with Deng Xiaoping. Um, in 1989, uh, the EU imposed an arms embargo on China, 1989. So uh, all this is not new, the systemic differences. Um, what has changed, in fact, is uh, that uh, the share of China in the world GDP uh, has uh, um, gone up from roughly 2, 3, 4% uh, uh, in the 1990s uh, to uh, today 20%. So this is a huge uh, growth in uh, economic-wise and consequently also political-wise, and that's uh, where the problem or where the challenge lies. How uh, can we deal with it? We can no longer ignore these systemic differences. Uh, it is a systemic competition. Uh, and as Michael said, we have a normative part and a political part of these normative uh, and these systemic differences, but we also have this, these systemic differences in trade and investments. Uh, and in fact, what we uh, what we have to deal with with China is an asymmetric, an asymmetric uh, competition in trade and investment. Um, and in fact, the, the, the main systemic difference is that you have this linkage, this conjunction of state and business in uh, China, which uh, makes it pretty effective uh, for the uh, leadership um, to conduct, for example, its modernization policy. Uh, because uh, it can direct its companies uh, into high-tech companies, buy them off in Germany or other countries. Um, and on the other hand, it can also um, um, make use of the companies for geopolitical um, projects to pursue geopolitical aims uh, with its companies. And that is also, uh, which has already been mentioned, the Belt and Road Initiative, where companies are um, in fact, in the front line of uh, geopolitics conducted by Beijing. In fact, we should also not uh, neglect the fact that all this uh, comes with a huge cost and uh, domestic uh, debt in China is, uh, is worrisome. Uh, and also in that respect, I would say it is not a sustainable policy. This also we have to bear in mind. Now, how shall we deal uh, with this challenge? And I think there are three ways uh, to address this systemic competition, in particular in the uh, field of uh, trade and uh, investments. Um, I think the first track is what Friedrich already mentioned, the dialogue. The dialogue is extremely important. 
and we are in negotiations uh, with uh, Beijing on the comprehensive agreement on investment. Uh, we have also sometimes to put pressure on China in order to demonstrate them uh, that uh, negotiations are needed. Uh, I think in some questions we should also reciprocate. We should um, um, uh, show that re reciprocity tactically um, is important in order to demonstrate that if we become more Chinese, then the whole uh, relationship for China becomes less interesting and they have no interest in us becoming more Chinese. So let's hope that the Chinese will become uh, more um, according to our standards. I would not agree with Fridolin saying that these dialogues are mainly monologues. <laughs> um, I think sometimes they have an impact. Um, and if you see how China um, now announced its, um, its goal of becoming CO2 neutral in 2060, I can assure you that this uh, is also a result of many conversations we had with the Chinese leadership. So that's the first track, dialogue. The second track is enhance our resilience, our own resilience. So China policy starts at home in Germany, in Europe, in Turkey, I suppose, as well. Um, we have uh, on the EU, EU level decided on an investment screening instrument. Uh, we are on a way to also introduce uh, a foreign subsidies instrument because we know that these state-owned companies have almost unlimited access to uh, subsidies from uh, from at home, so which uh, uh, somehow distorts and uh, the uh, level playing field. Uh, we uh, are also uh, thinking about an in, in international procurement um, instrument uh, because in the procurement process we also see some asymmetric advantages for uh, Chinese companies. We are addressing the uh, questions of IT security with an EU uh, 5G toolbox. And uh, we are in negotiations, as you can also read in the newspapers, uh, within our government on uh, a new law, um, uh, which also will provide means to address uh, the challenges uh, by um, Chinese companies that have a strong affiliation to the state and to the government and to the party. Uh, in order to um, keep our IT networks uh, safe. And finally, uh, we are also fighting disinformation uh, and false narratives uh, also on an EU basis, but also nationally uh, and all other uh, ways of um, uh, influencing our public opinion. That is this, the second track, so enhancing enhancement of our resilience. And the third track is um, diversity. We have to have more diversity in our relations, in particular trade and investment. And this is very much what uh, the Indo-Pacific guidelines are about, already mentioned by Fridolin, that our government adopted on the 2nd of September, uh, and which calls for uh, a mitigation of uh, dependencies, uh, a realignment, in fact, of our trade and investment policy, not in the sense of a decoupling, uh, but uh, more in uh, promoting other markets in the region. There is a huge potential in other countries of the Indo-Pacific. Uh, and the, the charm of um, diversifying these relations, not only in trade and investment, but also politically, is that also these countries of Southeast Asia, of South Asia, of the Indo-Pacific, in fact, pursue a pretty similar approach towards China as we do, a differentiated approach, a multi-dimensional approach and uh, uh, we don't have an interest in bipolarity and a new cold war, nor do they have. Uh, they don't want to be in a situation, put in a situation where they have to choose between the US uh, and China and nor do we have an interest. So there's a, a lot of scope for interacting and for teaming up uh, with these countries of the region. Finally, with your permission, one note of de-dramatization, at least as regards the role of China for the German economy. Here, I'm now talking uh, uh, only for the German economy. Yes, China is important. The Chinese market is important, in particular for several major German companies who, who sell more than a half of their uh, industrial um, uh, production in China and who earn more than half of their revenues in China. However, the overall picture of our external economic relations, uh, looking at this overall picture, we should not 
overestimate and also not overrate the role of China. Trade turned over uh, with China, including services, uh, has a share of 7.6% for the German uh, uh, overall trade. The Netherlands have 7.4. So we are more or less, China has a, a role to play in, pretty much comparable with the Netherlands. With the US, it's 8.6%. And with Europe altogether, it's 68%. Just to give you uh, a, a flavor of the role, I don't want to underestimate the role of China, but we should also not overestimate. And as I said, I'm talking for Germany. I know that in different, in other countries, the situation is pretty different, in particular in countries of the region, the neighboring countries, uh, and also uh, uh, for some countries, uh, even in Europe. Um, and of course, within the European Union, uh, we are shaping a policy uh, which uh, is uh, um, adequate and um, uh, conducive and uh, helpful for all the European member states, uh, but we should always not um, over-dramatize uh, the role of China for our economies. Thank you. Unmute myself. Uh, okay, I'm back unmuted. Thank you, Jasper, for, uh, for a very comprehensive introduction uh, into the topic. I'd like to follow up um, on three aspects um, on um, the Belt and Road Initiative that has been mentioned by all of you. Um, and uh, a very quick question to all three of you and possibly a very quick answer, um, uh, Jasper, um, for you on connectivity, where do we stand? Um, uh, Maike, on a digital Silk Road, um, where do you see the challenges uh, from the perspective of the Europeans and, uh, and Turkish uh, policy and also industry? And Mehmet, a question uh, I would like you to start on Belt and Road. Um, uh, if I look at the Western, Euro Western European debate on Belt and Road, um, we see a dramatic deterioration of a positive China image in most Belt and Road countries in the last two, three, four years. Uh, if I look to Sri Lanka, to Peru, um, country you mentioned earlier, um, uh, and in our own countries, um, we see that the China image um, completely changed from a very positive, innovative image um, to a very poor image. Um, how, how would you describe um, the, the Turkish perception um, of China and Chinese role um, in the Belt and Road countries? Yes, I think uh, one thing is quite clear. Chinese, they don't have any experience of managing cross-border mega projects, <coughs> the kind of projects that we are talking about, because they have never done this before. The magnitude of this project, Belt and Road Initiative, is 18 times bigger than the Marshall Plan that the United States had introduced after the Second World War. And the Chinese initially naively put so much money into that, but this has gone into bottomless pit. Then they learned, and now they are looking for tangible assets. And also they use Chinese engineering, labor, finance, technology, what you have. There is little co local content in it. And as you mentioned, in Sri Lanka, in Malaysia, Pakistan, Central Asian republics, when I go there for investment in my own business, energy, they all come and say that if it is Chinese, don't come here. <clears throat> Bring us Western capital, Western investors. <clears throat> you are right. China has not managed this BRI in an effective way. I'm sitting on the International Advisory Board of BRI and helping Chinese to understand how the international community is viewing it. They are sometimes quite frustrated saying that we are the only party in the world pouring billions of dollars into connectivity, into infrastructure, from smart grids to pipelines and what you have. But the world is not appreciating it. So I think they have to learn that. Uh, they have to understand that not only what they want to achieve, to what extent their desires, ambitions, and designs 
are responding to the needs of these nations. I think there is a similar frustration in Turkey as well. First, as I mentioned, huge trade deficit. In return, perhaps there could have been some Chinese investment flows and China has been very slow in this regard as well. There are some political and also economic conditionality, which we suffered in the past from other powers as well. So we have to make a space and China will learn this game. So things are not moving the way China hoped it will. So this is a learning process for them as well. Therefore, I don't think that this could be considered as a big problem because BRI is there to stay. It's not going to evaporate just because there are some mistakes made. Also, there is a great deal of frustration within China. If you ask the men in the street in Sichuan or Guangzhou or Harbin, they are questioning how come that we don't have enough money for our infrastructure, food and welfare. And the government is pouring all these billions of dollars to other countries along the, the ancient Silk Road, maritime road. So it's two way street in a way, but it's not going to go away. China is determined to keep it, learn the lessons, and try to perfect as much as it can. Thank you very much. Uh, very good answer. Uh, Mike, um, if I revert to a, an earlier saying of Mehmet, he warned us um, that we would, would, that we might see um, if we don't approach China and give China room, um, we might see an alliance um, of the West vis-a-vis -vis, um, an alliance that China builds. Um, if I look into the digital world, probably we are already there. Uh, if I look on the debate, um, I see around 5G network equipment. Um, uh, if I look at uh, the decoupling in the data world between the large Chinese market with obligations of data localization, data disclosure, um, uh, then we already have a trend that uh, some international companies um, uh, pull main data and R&D activities either out of China or into China to make their, their business in China more independent from the business of the rest of the world. How would you describe um, this problem uh, with uh, Silk Road um, and the digital aspects connected to it? Well, yes, it's definitely a, a big challenge. And it's uh, the trend, as you described it, is, uh, is certainly worrying. And I think this um, brings me back to what uh, uh, Mr. Wick was just saying, that uh, it's so important that the EU is also investing in resilience in our own instruments so that we have it more of a choice, at least. Because uh, the US-China tech conflict obviously is, uh, is, is heavily impacting us. I don't think we have really much of a choice um, because we are still normatively very closely aligned to the United States. Um, but at the same time, as we see from the, the EU push against also uh, United States big tech companies, you know, the, the, the wish now for, to add more regulation um, also on, on big tech um, to fight some of the monopolies and the way that they treat and manage and store data. Um, I think it's extremely important that the EU is investing in this so that over time we have indeed the opportunity to steer away from that black and white image, as I call it, uh, and make sure that we have gray zone to move in. Um, because it's clear, obviously, that the, the, the Chinese push to, exit, to get their um, tech companies going abroad is, is augmenting the interoperability and the compatibility of those companies with any third country that they go to, especially Southeast Asia is a sort of ground zero, if you will, for China. Um, Europe is, of course, another very important playground. Um, but the success of those overseas companies is then contributing again to Chinese economic competitiveness, um, but also to a sort of a more a normative high ground, if you will, for the Chinese. And I think that is uh, the challenge that I, I couldn't really delve into much detail just now. Um, but the way that the Chinese organize their economy is one thing that is, uh, you know, defining that systemic rivalry. Um, but it's also the way that they deal with data. Um, you know, sometimes it's said that the United States, um, it's the big tech companies that own the data. In China, it's basically the state that wants the data. 
Um, but what the EU wants, what most Southeast Asian companies want, and what also Japan and other countries in Asia want, is for the consumers to have more of a say. Um, and that is, I think, where, uh, again, um, Mr. Wieck uh, was so right when he said we have to look for more diversified cooperation. That's why the Indo-Pacific is so important. And that's why I think the digital element to the Indo-Pacific uh, strategy um, is important. So since you asked about the EU uh, connectivity, where does it stand? Um, from what I know, at least, we are now trying to evolve from um, this EU-Asia um, connectivity strategy of 2018, which was, again, very much focused on Asia, so mo moving that towards uh, a more global scope, which I think is more in line with what it should be. Um, and then also focusing very much on the digital element, because this is where the future will be in this fourth industrial evolu revolution that we are now in, where IT is no longer just one sector of the economy, it's ingrained in every part of the economy. And it's not just 5G that we are dealing with, but it's really the platform companies that are also impacting on our societies, on our democracies. Um, and the way that we organize those, I think, it can still be, uh, if we really act now, we can still be in time to have more space to operate in the gray zones rather than to be forced either by China or the United States um, to, to pick sides. And I think it's in the interest of Europe to avoid that um, and also in the interest of, of most countries in Asia that would love to cooperate with Europe. Thank you very much, Mike. Uh, Jasper, I um, always ask for connectivity because complaining about the Chinese initiative um, is a poor reflection. Um, we should be better and we should do something ourselves and we should be initiative ourselves. This is why I always try to ask for connectivity, even though um, we are sometimes slower um, and uh, we are more cautious in achieving uh, fast results because we want our projects to be sustainable. What would you ask if you uh, are asked on uh, the question where do we stand uh, with connectivity initiative vis-a-vis -vis Belt and Road, or shouldn't I say it's vis-a-vis -vis Belt and Road, it stands for itself? Uh, Fridoli, I couldn't agree more. We should not complain about BRI. In fact, BRI addresses real and urgent needs of the region. And in fact, it's a global need. Uh, for connectivity in all spheres, including the digital uh, sphere. Um, but as Mehmet said, the way the Chinese are doing it is not uh, sustainable. And there's a lot of disillusionment in the countries that have gone that road, um, also because of these um, debt for equity swaps and the loss of sovereignty. And even, uh, and in particular, uh, smaller countries are very uh, sensitive when it comes to the questions of sovereignty and their uh, uh, very right and, and being very sensitive about these issues. So it has um, lost quite a momentum. Now, the EU has adopted its, uh, uh, its connectivity strategy. This is uh, nice and good, <laughs> but it should not lead to false expectations. Uh, the EU is not able and also not willing to compete with BRI in particular regarding the amount of money that is put on the table. We simply simply do not have state money in such an abundance and even China has not that money, but they simply uh, uh, take loans and that's why they have this domestic debt uh, in an incredible size. We are not copying, uh, we are not duplicating uh, anything alike, but we have another approach which is figuring, as you said, a bit more complicated, which takes a bit more time. Uh, because in the end, we, are, we rely on the private sector. Uh, and this private sector has to be encouraged. It has to be encouraged with, by EU instruments that are at hand, but it has also uh, to be encouraged by the nations, by EU member states. The EU is more than Brussels. The EU, EU is 27 member states. And they have to direct their uh, development cooperation uh, more into the direction of connectivity. And this process takes a bit of time. But once you have your development banks on board, also your private banks on board, uh, and private sector, which then um, cooperates with the private sector uh, in the countries concerned, and Mehmet made a very important point about, um, about local content, 
um, then it should fly. And for the time being, the, the process has been launched. The process uh, is also um, uh, followed up by um, uh, partnerships that we establish with countries of the region, for example, with Japan. We will also probably sign a connectivity declaration, the EU with ASEAN on the 1st of um, December. Uh, and there are other countries, for example, India, uh, who um, has launched an initi initiative on quality infrastructure, addressing the problem of lack of sustainability of many infrastructure projects launched by, um, by uh, uh, in the framework of BRI. Uh, so I fully agree we are slower, we are more cautious, but our policy is more sustainable uh, and it takes on board uh, the private sector, which is uh, extremely important, and it uh, takes on board uh, the means that we have at hand in the countries concerned uh, so that they benefit uh, to a maximum uh, for their whole economy by such infrastructure projects. Thank you, Jasper. I would like to close this panel with a very quick round um, since we talk about um, geopolitical relations um, with a very quick round. Um, and possibly try to limit yourself to a one sentence answer. Um, what would be your wish or your expectation addressing Joe Biden as new president um, of the United States vis-a-vis um, -vis China? What should he do or what do you expect him to do? Um, and we continue uh, in a reverse order uh, where we started with our introductions. Uh, Jasper, if you like to start, with what would be your wish or expectation to the president? Okay, my, my wish number one, please no longer offer international organizations on a silver tray to China. Excellent. Mehmet. Yes, my expectation is uh, Biden should engage positively with China because when I talk to my Chinese colleagues, they are really very, very... Uh, furious with Michael, uh, Mike Pompeo and Trump. We recognize how important China is. We recognize how important US and EU is. And we need to have an atmosphere of understanding, partnership and dialogue. Otherwise, things will move in the direction of confrontation. This is lose-lose situation for all of us. Thank you. I Mike. Biden should also work with EU, not alone. I would be complimenting uh, the other two gentlemen, um, but calling for multilateralism. Um, the United States has retreated, of course, from uh, multilateralism on many different fronts, going back there so that he can achieve his right goals uh, with better uh, approaches, better means, um, together with like-minded uh, partners and with China where possible. But Thank, you, Mike. My... Thank you. With that, uh, I close the first panel on geopolitical relations uh, with China. And I thank very much um, Maike okano Heimans from Klingendal, um, Mehmet Ögücü, um, representative today um, actually for TÜSIAD, um, and uh, Jasper Wieck from the German Foreign Office. Um, it was a great pleasure moderating you um, because I always um, love when I have the feeling we should have had much more time um, rather than the opposite, um, not knowing what else could I ask. We, I, we could have continued for quite some time with a very interesting discussion. Um, Bari, um, I hand over to you, um, but I also hand over to you with two difficulties. First, I took six minutes of your panel. And second, um, I did not take up some of the questions that came up in the last minutes uh, from the participants. If you can include them in the second panel, fantastic. If not, then it's my mistake. Uh, and now the floor is yours for the second panel, please. Mark. Dolly, thank you very much for your moderation. And I will try my best. I will do my best. Okay, um, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the second session of the webinar. In this part, we will discuss economic relations with China as China an economic partner or systemic competitor. In the second round, we have a three distinguished speakers, Ms. Maria Linda, 
policy coordinated trade strategy DG trade in the European Commission. Our second speaker, Mr. Noyan Rona, coordinator of TCI Shanghai Network, chief representative of uh, Guarantee Representative Office in China. Our third distinguished speaker, Dr. Patricia Solara, executive member of the board German Electrical and Electronic Manufacturers Association, chairman of the BDE Working Group Foreign Trade and Investment Policy. In this part, we have divided in two parts. In the first part, we will discuss uh, trade and investment relations of the European Union and Germany with China. In the second part, we will focus on the relations of Tur economic relations of Turkey with China. Our first speaker is Ms. Linda. After having worked on EU-China trade relations for a number of years, both at the EU delegation in China and in the China unit in the Directorate General for Trade of the European Commission. Ms. Maria Linda is currently the project coordinator in trade strategy of unit of the DG Trade in Brussels. She's a Swedish national and she has a degree in law from Uppsala University. Ms. Linda, you have the floor now. Well, thank you very much, uh, Professor Yilmaz. And good, good afternoon and good evening to everybody. It's a, it's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, in the last few minutes, my internet connection has been a bit shaky, so I hope I, I stay with you, uh, yes, you are with us. during my intervention. Uh, but if I, but but please let me know if if it doesn't work. Okay. And I, I I have to say that the session we had discussing the geopolitics was really um, quite illuminating. It was also very interesting to see how much trade was actually brought into the geopolitical discussion. And uh, uh, I think that's been something that's been fascinating to observe over the years, uh, and particularly the last few years, how much trade policy and the discussion on security and geopolitics has become together uh, more and more. And I'm not always sure it's a good thing, but it, it's where we are in the world today. And I, I should maybe just say a few words about what we actually do. Uh, the Trade Strategy Unit in DG Trade, uh, where I belong, we, we're actually in the process of coordinating a review of the EU's trade policy. And uh, you may have seen, we we have a public consultation on that, that is open actually, I think until Sunday. And we thought that it was a good time to start reviewing the EU's trade policy uh, because we know that there have been significant changes uh, in the whole international context in which EU policy operates. And this means, I mean, in the last few years, we've seen a lot of tensions between major economies. We've seen a lot of rise of the unilateralism and economic nationalism. Uh, also the fact that uh, geoeconomics comes in, we've seen how trade policy becomes increasingly weaponized. And we're concerned, we've seen how this can lead to the multilateral rules-based order um, weakening and global governance structures also weakening, sort of more general. So this is just a sort of basic overview of what we're working on. And now returning to China. Uh, I have to say, having worked on China for a number of years, it's actually been fascinating to see how EU's position on China has been evolving uh, when it comes to trade policy, but not only trade policy, and in the last few years. And uh, the, the, I mean, 10 years ago, the main focus was really uh, market access, EU market access to China. Uh, and now, given China's economic rise or global rise, the discussion has become much more complex and much more varied. So, the e I would say that actually the trade relationship between the EU and China is one of the most complex ones that we have. And it's not only due to its size, but it's due to the very many different layers that we have. 
And for example, the 2019 strategy that was that the both the European External Action Service and the European Commission jointly issued last year, and it's been mentioned a few times, said that China is simultaneously a cooperation partner, a negotiation partner, an economic competitor, and a systemic rival. And somehow we have to try and make our way through in that. Now, I've heard the word asymmetry mentioned several times in the previous session, and I think that is one of the things that has increasingly caused concern in, in Europe and amongst European trade policy. Uh, China was for a long time seen very much as the land of milk and honey, and it was somehow accepted that sort of the Chinese market was much more restricted than the European one. Now, over the, over the years, there have been lots of promises from the Chinese side to reform the market uh, and to open up and, uh, and sort of change the Chinese market to make it go in a more sort of market oriented direction. And I think the, the European business has used the word promise fatigue in the last few years because a lot of those promises haven't realized, haven't come. And at the same time, while we have these long-standing difficulties in accessing the Chinese market, the European market is quite open and is open and there are, there are various asymmetries there. And now this also in combination with other aspects has given rise to an increasing discussion in Europe about the need to improve the level playing field. And I think that's something that you see a lot. And make it clear, this does not mean shutting Europe off. It means, what it means really is, I mean, the ideal way that the EU would like, or at least the European Commission, but I think I, I think I can speak for the EU, would like to level a playing field and to sort of deal with these asymmetries is to level up. And by level up, we mean that we agree in the WTO, for example, on the trade side with our trading partners uh, on how to improve conditions. So we have engagement with China on this. We engage with Japan and the US trilaterally on this. And we also are negotiating since 2013, a comprehensive agreement on investment with China. Uh, and I, I checked, uh, we've just finished the 33rd round. But on the other side, uh, we realized that we probably have to increase our defenses more and make sure that we have a toolbox because we see now that with countries such as China who are so huge, but have very interventionist industrial policies that uh, we, this can create serious distortions on the European market. And that's why we are looking at some of these tools to rebalance the situation unilaterally when we have, when we have to. So that's the other side of the, of the relationship. Um, and I realized that I should probably come to an end now uh, to, to give the others a chance to speak. Uh, but we have also, of course, there is also a security dimension. We have just, uh, the European, the screening of foreign direct investment has just entered into application. Uh, so that's a European coordination met method to sort of increase investment. And I should also just say something about uh, the COVID-19 crisis and the discussions that are going on resilience, on uh, nearshoring, reshoring, diversification. I don't think that we are headed for a deep coupling from China. I don't think that's anything we want, but there is definitely a discussion going on in Europe about how to diversify value supply chains and how to do that. So it's very, it's very difficult to sort of give an overview of where we are with China in these 10 minutes, but hopefully this gives a bit of food for thought. Okay, thank you <laughs> very much, Ms. Linda. Okay, our second speaker is Mr. Noyan Rona. Mr. Noyan Rona has been living around 35 years, if I am not wrong, in China. He is now one of the best Chinese experts in Turkey and outside Turkey. Mr. Noyan Rona graduated from Ankara University, Sinologi, Department of Chinese Studies, and then he studied at Beijing and Wuhan universities. And from Wuhan University in China, he graduated as the first Turkish citizen to receive a master's degree. In 1986, 
Mr. Rona began working as a China regional specialist for the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. He served in Turkish embassy in Beijing and as a consulate general of Shanghai. Mr. Rona, the floor is open for you. Thank you. Thank you for giving me this opportunity. Let me take up with your question in the line with the topic of this session. That is, if China is an economic partner for Turkey. I am sure there are many academic definitions for the concept of partnership, but to an outsider as a practitioner like myself, a healthy and lasting partnership should have first an element of equality and second, a common purpose uh, between the partners. Next year will be the 50th anniversary of diplomatic relations between Turkey and China. As someone who personally lived the 40 years of the South century, I think uh, I can be a little bit uh, undiplomatic at this point and say, state that Turkey and China have so far failed to realize these most important aspects of partnership. And why do I say so then? First, rather than a shared purpose, both countries have been following their own different purpose against one and another, which is China is trying to gain more from Turkish market and Turkey trying to do the same in China. So the overall vision of the relations remain rather narrow and market focused. More recently, China's, China's goals, Go Global and Belt and Road initiatives added new shared interest of bilateral agenda. As a result, China started to study and explore investment opportunities in Turkey more closely. Accordingly, Chinese investment in Turkey reached 2 billion USD. Despite these positive but still small steps, I do not think that we managed to full overcome the narrowness of vision on both sides. This brings me to my second point of lasting the partnership between Turkey and China, the element of equality. Obviously, China has been more successful in the Turkish market than Turkey has been in China. This not only led a huge trade imbalance in favor of China, but also diminished the essential element of equality in relations. Again, to the uh, favor of China and in very unbalanced way. Let me give some uh, figures to explain this. Turkey-China bilateral trade has been increasing steadily. According to Chinese customs, trade volume reached 20 billion USD in 2019. Chinese export to Turkey were 17 billion USD, while Turkish export were only 3 billion USD. Turkey's foreign trade deficit in 2019 was 31 billion USD, so half of it came from China. In its 50-year-long diplomatic relations, Turkey gave a trade surplus with China only in the years 1993, 94, and 98. At all other times, the trade war balance was hugely in favor of China. Indeed, the gap could not be narrowed but got wider over time, especially after China's WTO membership. The increasing uh, trade volume is in fact the result of increase in Turkish imports. China has consistently been a major factor in Turkish current account deficit. And this is why my answer the question, to the question is, is China an economic partner to Turkey? would be China is currently more as more of supplier than a partner for Turkey. However, the current state of affairs should not mislead us to think that there is no basis or potential for the two sides to develop a lasting partnership. To the contrary, there is the potential, but it has not been used so far. And there are certain steps both sides should take together, mainly to fulfill the two essentials of lasting uh, partnership. That is to take concerted steps in order to ensure a workable equality in economics and trade relations. 
In that sense, I can propose the following steps. Turkey itself produced various high quality intermediate goods. The procurement of these goods from within Turkey should be supported to reduce imports from China. The import from China of low quality, low price consumer goods should be also reduced, for example, by applying advanced standards of quality to such imports. Many Turkish firms do not have on their own sufficient economic and financial strength to compete in China. It is too big and too costly for them. Turkey can establish sectoral structures to bring these firms together and share costs. In that way, we can create better economics of scale for Turkish goods in the uh, Chinese market. China has growing white color medium income consumer group. Turkey produces reasonably priced high quality consumer goods. If these can be well marketed to the middle income Chinese consumers, Turkey can find a considerable uh, potential there. Turkey-China relations should not be reduced to, to commercial relations alone, as if they are a mere buying and selling activity, rather they must be addressed as a part of a wider economic partnership. Following that spread, China investment in Turkey should be supported as a means to balance the trade deficit. The investment environment should be improved accordingly and Turkey should be promoted more actively in, in China as an investment destination. For example, the Panda bonds can be another uh, worthy in, instrument in attracting Chinese investors. Investment, their issuings should be speeded up and volumes expanded. Bilateral trade with national currency should be encouraged to ease foreign exchange risk for businessmen. Turkey hosts the second largest segment of ancient Silk Road after China. Within the current Belt and Road Initiative, the aim should be to benefit more extensively from the uh, BRI's resources, especially financial ones for Turkey's, uh, Turkey's development. In that respect, the following points are important to note. The BRI expected to take 50 years to complete. It is one of the Chinese most important developed development strategies. That is why successful implementation of BRI is also a matter of prestige for China. As the financial leg of the BRI, China took Mr. Brona, could you sum up, please? Okay, I can, I can get, definitely, the list, uh, I can make this much longer. These are the, uh, just a few beginning steps of the, make Turkey and China true partners of each other. First, the establishing an element of the equality and balancing their relations, and second, by leading both countries towards the shared purpose and joint uh, action. Uh, action. If I uh, if I exit my time, I'm sorry for that. Thank you for uh, listening yeah. for me. Okay, thank you very much. Now our third speaker is Dr. Patricia Solaru. She is executive member of the board German Electrical and Electronic Manufacturers Association, chairman of BDE Working Group for Trade and Investment Policy. Dr. Solaro studied biology with a focus on genetics and graduated at the University of Stuttgart Hockenheim and in Cologne. Before she's joining the industry, Dr. Solaro advised founders of the biotech companies and banks as an independent management consultant postdoctoral she has sorry uh, she has building up the biotech association by Gan tech in North Rhine Westphalia which won the federal bio regime competition in 1996 under her chairmanship Mr. Dr. Dr. the floor is open for you yeah, Professor Jemans, thank you very much. Um, good afternoon to everybody. 
Thanks a lot, uh, the organizers of this um, very interesting meeting um, to have the opportunity to speak about the German perspective and as well as the um, perspective of the electronic industry uh, on the economic relationship with China. Let me start with some figures um, since I would like to um, point out the importance of the relationship with China, a bit contrary to what uh, Mr. Week said uh, in the former session, um, since, for example, for the um, electronic industry, uh, when you look at the Chinese part of the global electro production, the part of China is now 50.1%. So that is uh, really um, an in the important um, market for uh, the German electronic industry. Uh, when you look in overall the um, German Chinese trade volume in 2019 was 219 billion euro. Um, that is uh, around 40% of the overall trade volume between the EU and um, China. China is uh, for Germany the most important um, trade partner, not only um, out of the EU, but in general. The German exports to China in 2019 were 96 billion, the imports were 123 billion euro. Um, I think I stop here in order to save some time, but it was for me important to mention at least those figures. And um, I would like to highlight now in the um, second part, I have three parts of my um, introduction, um, the BDI paper, uh, which were mentioned by Frieden Struck uh, in the intro. Um, which we supported uh, very much. And there are six um, in general recommendations or parts of the recommendations um, to the EU, um, which we um, summarized um, the following way. We said that um, it's very important that we need a broad discussion and um, orientation with regard to the uh, increased challenge which we are facing through the systemic competition um, which China um, is producing with the Western world. Um, secondly, um, there's a partnership as well as the competition. Um, since China is still a very dynamic growing market, market and, and also a driver of the world economic, um, we need to um, have an open discussion about it. And uh, we want still to use this chance of the um, economic trade with China. Therefore, what have we to do? Uh, we, we call the European Union um, strengthening um, the competition of the EU. Um, namely by a very ambitious industry strategy um, where um, a, more is focused on research, development, um, education, infrastructure and um, future technologies. Um, fourth, uh, we think that a strong and united uh, Europe, that is the best way to um, discuss with China um, at the level playing field. Um, we think that it's important that um, to highlight and, and strengthen that no nation alone can deal uh, with China. We need to unify, um, which also means that we have uh, not only um, to work as the European Union, but that we also um, find international cooperations and build that up with like-minded partners and um, by that enlarge um, the, the, the um, basis for discussion with China. 
And um, last but not least, um, we think that it's important, and that is, um, I think, why this paper was so or got so much attention. Um, that we said, um, although we um, we still are very convinced that the best way for a strong global uh, economy is a WTO-based um, trade system. Um, we, we recognize that uh, the European Union has also to strengthen its own instruments um, to deal with, um, let's say, uh, the state-owned um, companies in, uh, which are um, somehow out of the economic system um, because of the strong support they uh, get from um, their home country. And so we are in support um, of the um, things which Mr. Week mentioned uh, when he said that we have to enhance our own resilience with investment screening, foreign um, subsidiaries instrument or the international procurement instrument of, the, of Germany as well as the EU. Now, um, let me give you um, as my third part of uh, my introduction, a short case study um, mentioning Europe Electro. That is a um, working group, China working group with a focus on technical market access for the European electronic industry, focusing on standardization, certification, regulatory requirements and the like. So this is the way how industry itself is trying to contribute to the dialogue with China. Um, this office is open since 2007 in Beijing. Um, head of the office is a Chinese woman who has access to the Chinese standardization bodies. Um, this setup helps us to establish a mutual understanding of international standards and how to adopt them to the Chinese market. This is also a tool, a great tool, um, um, to have um, better market access. And um, we try to uh, contribute um, with this office um, to a discussion about the open market in China. The working group is financed by the ZBI as well as companies who have become a member of the working group. And um, the membership is open to European companies uh, with activities in the electronic industry sector even when they are not a member of the ZBI and we are in a cooperation with Orgalim, European um, Association of the Electronic and Manufacturers Industry. So um, asking the question, is China an economic partner? We say, yes, indeed. It's an important one, but not unconditionally. This means that we are very eager to conduct a continuous exchange and solid relationship, even uh, in high high tech areas. However, we recognize that we are at the same time in a systemic competition with China, in increasing competition. And if China wants to deepen its relationship with Europe, it has to open its markets also for foreign companies. From our perspective, the best way to do this is a dialogue about mutual interest exchange. You can also say a leveling playing field and simultaneously a strengthening of the European instruments, as I mentioned it before. Um, in the set we, I, um, we claim that we have a pragmatic constructive approach. Um, we try to use chances. We try to accept the challenges and we want to minimize risks by increasing the resilience of our companies. So overall, we firmly believe that an economical and political strong European coalition is the best basis um, for successful economic interaction with China. And I, if I um, may to add um, the US selection, the outcome of the US selection, I think is now very much strengthening the position of the European Union. Um, and um, we call the EU for um, more self-confidence in the discussion with China, since um, I think we have a lot to offer 
and um, it only works with China when we are um, discussing um, at the level playing fields. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Solaru. Now I would like to go back. Um, we have no mu not, not much time left. I have uh, some questions, um, one or two questions to Ms. Linda. The one of them is, China is the EU biggest source of imports and its second biggest export market. China and Europe trade on average over 1 billion euro every day. My question is, um, there are trade disputes between Beijing and Brussels of the European Union. When China joined the World Trade Organization in 2001, it agreed to reform and liberalize important parts of its economy. But China has made progress, some progress, some problems remain unchanged. And the problems are a lack of transparency, industrial policy and non-tariff measures that discriminate against foreign companies, strong government intervention in the economy, resulting in a dominant position for state-owned firms, unequal access to subsidized and cheap, finance, cheap financing and poor protection and enforcement of intellectual property rights. My question is, you had a summit meeting in 14 of September this year. The European Union or the representatives of the European Union or the politicians, were they able to solve one of these problems, reached an agreement with Beijing, solving this problem with China? Um, Lina. Yeah, thank you, Professor Yilmaz. Um, well, I think that uh, of the issues that you raised, uh, these are all very, very long-standing issues, uh, and in a way, it provides a good overview of of some of the most concerning issues we have in our trade relations with China. And when you ask if we've solved them, I think the issues we have a lot of these are very deep, systemic issues. And the current rules, global rules, may would, probably, would need to be updated. So that's one of the reasons why we are suggesting a reform of the rules in the WTO and the World Trade Organization, and why we've engaged in a bilateral dialogue with China to discuss this. Uh, but we're also working together with the US and Japan trilaterally to try and look at what rules could be. Uh, in the future, but uh, it's it's more of a long-standing work than uh, something that was resolved in in this uh, leaders' call in uh, September. And of course, we continue with the negotiations uh, for a comprehensive agreement on investment as well, which we're working on bilaterally with China. So I don't I don't know if that answers your question, but uh... yes, do you think you can reach an agreement in the coming years? Because still the negotiations process still going on for all between Beijing and uh, Brussels. Yes, I mean, it's, I, I, I think 33 rounds is quite extensive uh, negotiation rounds. Yes. But yes, we launched in, in 2013 and I, we would hope to. But I think one of the things we always say is that uh, because this is a very important agreement and that is that substance is more important than speed. So uh, I don't think we would want to give up on the substance because it's just too important for the EU. So, uh, you know, there, there, there, there's engagement, but uh, how quickly right. it will go, I really That's can't tell at this point in time. What are the difficulties, problems you are facing in negotiation process with Beijing? What are the main obstacles? Well, I think, I mean, always at the end, you get to the most difficult issues. And uh, I think uh, issues uh, related to trade and sustainable development, uh, which are becoming increasingly important, are quite difficult. Um, and there are other parts uh, of, the, of the negotiations which are difficult. But, but I mean, the, the, 
the negotiations have intensified and uh, we'll, we'll just have to see how, how it goes. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Okay, Mr. Rona, um, may I ask you two yes. questions? And one question is, yes, sure. what are the main options in relations between China and Turkey? Sorry, I couldn't get the, what are the main? What are the main obstacles or the oh, problems, okay. problem between Beijing and Ankara? Why Turkey is not able to invest more? As far as I know, um, Turkey has already invested one around 100 million, million dollars in China, whereas China has invested two million, two billion dollars in Turkey. Is there any interest? There is no interest from the Turkish business society investing in China. Actually, you know, uh, yes, uh, the figure is right, correct, and then the Chinese investment in Turkey is around two billion USD, and the Turkish uh, investment in China is one billion. But uh, recent years, the Turkish company getting. Uh, losing their interest to go China, I mean, to come to China to do some uh, factory and uh, doing business because Chinese market is losing their uh, uh, their advantage as a, a low labor cost. So if the Turkish company now invest in China, it should be for Chinese local market. But before they are uh, investing in China for just exporting the third countries because of the low cost uh, products. So that's why recent years, Turkish companies, there's uh, no, no, not many Turkish companies coming, but some trade company tried to come into China, but uh, the China is too big and too costly and takes time and then they're doing business uh, uh, is not same as the as in Turkey, and Turkish company has not enough uh, financial strength to wait long time in Chinese market and then sell their products. So that's why Turkish company, I think, they focus their intention uh, around Turkish market, like EU and the other surrounding company uh, countries. That's why. Uh, these are the obstacles for Turkish side, and the uh, Chinese are more more uh, attract, uh, more uh, more brave than Turkish companies because they have enough uh, financial strain go to Turkey, and then uh, as a step to EU market, so they invest in Turkey. My second question is: uh, Turkey, Turkish government tries to borrow money from the from China. Yes. Would you tell us something about this business? Uh, you know, uh, there are uh, they, the Panda Bond. They issue a Turkish papers and other for Turkish uh, business uh, investment. But it didn't make a huge amount, enough sufficient amount that. Uh, beside this, uh, some uh, two of the biggest policy banks in China, which is China Exim Bank and China Development Bank, they are investing, sort of investing in Turkey. They are financing some Turkish companies with huge amount. And also they are participating in Turkish banks syndicated loan. Uh, and then they uh, lend uh, some uh, money to Turkish banking sector. These are the main way to coming uh, Turkish, uh, the Chinese uh, hot money coming to the Turkish uh, market. And the other side, the, some Companies, Chinese companies, if they get a project in Turkey, they bring their own financials, the the the the, the, the money uh, to Turkish uh, project. So these are the main 
main stream that money coming to Turkey. But as uh, as uh, sometimes we we we read in the in the uh, press saying that you know uh, China is giving that that money to Turkey, just only uh, one we know that around uh, two billion USD uh, coming to uh, Turkish uh, treasury. The other than not not uh, enough or not that much uh, investment. In money in, in Turkey, actually Chinese has to invest in Turkish commercial papers, financial papers, and banking sector. But it is not enough or sufficient uh, investment uh, from China to Turkey. Okay, thank you very much. Now uh, there is no questions from the participants. I try to, to close the gap. Now my questions to Dr. Um, you have pointed out in your presentation about um, uh, negotiations for the investment agreement, which began in 2013. Is there any improvement in negotiation process between, between um, Brussels or between Germany and Beijing in respect to investment agreement? Well, the um, with regard to the investment agreement, um, we hope that there is um, an improvement. Um, what we take as a good sign um, are the discussions uh, now during the German presidency of the EU, um, where Chancellor Merkel talked with uh, China's President Xi Jinping. Um, unfortunately, we did not um, have, because of Corona, this meeting in Leipzig, um, which was set up as a, or planned as a, a huge Chinese convention. <coughs> um, but um, for the German industry, it's very important that there is um, a coming forward, that there are um, improvements in this agreement talks but um, also important is to mention that uh, from the German, um, from German uh, economy side or the, the um, German industry, um, we also think, and I can applaud Maria Linders um, for their statement that substance is more important than speed. We see this uh, the same way. Um, it's better um, to talk a bit longer, um, but set up the right conditions. We have um, no advantage um, if there is a speedy agreement, um, which is not achieving the level playing field. Level playing field is the utmost goal and um, it takes as long as it takes. I think, uh, as I mentioned, um, through the US and the outcome of the US election, um, Europe is strengthened in its position. Um, China is coming under pressure since they now know that there will be a much better relationship again between uh, Europe and um, in the US. And therefore I think the likelihood for a good agreement with China um, is now better than before. Okay. Thank you very much. Perhaps I would like to inform the participants, the negotiations um, for the investment agreement aim to improve investment for European and Chinese investors by creating investment rights and guaranteeing non-discrimination, improve transparency, licensing, and authoritarian procedures, provide a high and balanced level of protection for investors, especially investment, and put in place rules and, on environmental and labor related aspects of foreign investments. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to thank all these distinguished um, speakers for their contribution to the topic of the relations of European Union or Turkey with China. With your thank permission, you. I am going to close this session. Thank you very much for it. Thank you. Uh, I would like to thank Professor Yilmaz and to all 
the panelists for their stimulating speeches. Now, um, before the end, I would like to give the word to Professor Yilmaz and then Mr. Stark for their closing remarks, please. Uh, Mr. Uh, I don't want to add not too much. I would like to thank to BDE and TUSIAT for the cooperation in, to organize this meeting in November in this year. I would like to thank to all participants and I would like to thank to all um, speakers they made a great contribution to the topic and thank you very much. Mr. Stark, could thank we have so your... Much, Ari, um, uh, and uh, thank you for, for calling. Um, I found this session highly interesting um, because um, the debate we had in both panels very well reflects um, that there is no one way in dealing with China. Um, it's clear we need cooperation. It's unclear where are the limits. Um, it's clear we need dialogue. It's unclear how can we deal with issues where China restricts dialogue on ethical standards um, in the Uyghur province of Xinjiang um, ethical standards in dealing with Hong Kong. Um, that is unclear and it's not easy to come up with solutions. Um, we have seen interesting hidden hints that, of course, we need a technological cooperation with China because China is a powerhouse of new technology, of innovation. At the same time, um, we have heard calls to be more restrictive um, in uh, letting Chinese investment into the European Union um, and be cautious uh, in letting Chinese providers uh, equip our 5G network. Um, so this tension that I raised in the beginning, it's there. And for each individual um, issue, we have to come to conclusions in dealing with the issues, in dealing with China. Um, and I must say, I learned very much from this Turkish perspective that, um, of course, the one answer is simple. Um, China is has grown to a status of a world power. Um, and of course, it deserves its place um, in this concert of world power. Um, we only have one second world power, which is the United States, and we have an economic world power, which is the European Union, which is no global political world power. And probably this is um, a conclusion that we can draw from the EU side. Um, we have a potential of playing a role in this concert, um, but we only have a potential if we include partners um, and Turkey, and uh, as we also see in the difficulties in our transatlantic relations, Russia are considered as integral partners um, for many in Europe um, and certainly for European business. Um, with that brief reflection, um, I would wholeheartedly thank you, um, Korhan Koridoglu. Um, I also would like uh, to thank you, Barry Hilmas, for the excellent cooperation. Um, and let me please include in my thanks um, to all the participants. Um, uh, I, I would like to include Hale Hatipolu um, from Tusiat, um, her colleague Asli Bashkara Kaolu, um, and my colleague Ferdinand Schaff, who both prepared the seminar together in an excellent way, selected good speakers, um, and uh, uh, to Tusiat, um, it was fun to work together, it was fun to do this together, um, and I very much thank you um, that on a Friday evening you stick here with us um, in Germany, in Brussels, uh, to discuss China issues, and I appreciate it very, very much, and I would like to continue this dialogue with 
Tschüssi at Sabanchi. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Stark. And uh, on behalf of TUSIAT, I would like to thank you all distinguished panelists, moderators and participants attending our webinar from different countries and institutions. Today, uh, I believe that we made an enlightening discussion on China and global economic order, evaluating from the perspective of the EU, Germany and Turkey. Although uh, much more time needed to cover all aspects of this important topic and make a more interactive session with all participants, unfortunately, we are at the end of our webinar and I hope that we can pick up from here in the near future. Uh, we tried to explore the role of China in the global economical order, discuss the European Union's and Turkey's economic relations with China, and analyze, try to analyze the economic consequences of the increasing global rivalry between US and China. Our panelists, I think, that agreed that China's global weight will continue to increase in the global area. Uh, China will continue to be an important economical uh, partner and worldwide uh, need understanding and cooperation is very necessary for incorporate Chinese, China's uh, rising natural economic leadership. I believe that it will be more critical to concretely clarify our policies on China and find a balanced approach and prevent polarization in our relations, keeping in mind that solving the global problems are more important than competition with businesses uh, and countries. So with that uh, remark, uh, I would like to say that it was a great pleasure to co-host uh, this event with German Federation of Industries, in cooperation with the program of economics at Sabanji University. And I would, I would like to thank you, all the participants and all the moderators, and wish you a, a wonderful uh, weekend to all. Thank you all for participating. Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay, see you.